Hi, everybody. This is Rick Geiler with Silverside Insurance here in Tempe, Arizona. And for today's presentation, I have with us Tony Fiorillo. He's the president and founder of Asset Management Strategies in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm going to get it over to Tony here in a second. Uh, Tony accurately called the election for us by predicting with a 86% probability that if the markets were down between August and the end of October, the rival party would capture the White House. So I'm going to introduce Tony, and I'm going to say kudos for you on that pick, Tony. Uh, thanks, Rick. I don't know if I want to take full responsibility for that, but, uh, yeah, that was a historic measure that actually goes from the 1st of August to the end of October. So, um, And it's eighty. it was 86 percentile probability. Uh, and with this, with probably the size of sampling that we have there, I would guess that that probability next time would be over 90 percent. So uh, pretty surprising. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I, I don't think uh, this election – uh, pandered to any historic measurements <laughs> whatsoever. So. Now, now it was outside the box in, in about every way you could say. Well, I'm going to get it over to you today. Uh, Tony has some stuff for us on some of the election uh, fallout, uh, what that's doing with what we see in the interest rate market, hopefully some more market predictions since Tony has now proven he's a great prognosticator. And then he's going to touch on some of the regulations we may or may not see with the new administration. So with that, Tony, I'm going to get it over to you. And uh, the pressure's on to uh, outdo yourself from last time. <laughs> I appreciate that, Rick. Yeah, I think everybody's still shocked from these election results. I, uh, I, I don't know which election you're talking about. I was talking about the fact that Dwayne The Rock Johnson beat me out for Sexiest Man Alive again. Was that the election you were talking about? <clears throat> Probably more uh, the presidential election, I'm guessing, is the concern for most people. But, the um, yeah, quite a shocker. And I think that uh, it was the general sentiment was uh, I don't think it was so much necessarily against Hillary and for Trump as much as it was uh, just a pure anti-establishment vote. You know, we saw that throughout the uh, Democratic primary where there were many states where Hillary was neck and neck with uh, Bernie Sanders. And I think that we saw that uh, in the Republican primary as Trump, you know, one by one knocked off 15 or 16 other contenders in that race. And most of those were more establishment type people. Surprising, I, I think if you if you had ever expected the libertarians or the independents to, to show better, uh, this would have certainly been the year. But... I think what happened was that Trump got more of that independent uh, vote, and I think pretty much everybody that was an anti-establishment, even on the Democratic side, uh, were not necessarily favoring Hillary and wanted something different than the than the status quo, uh, and that's how it ended up. So we'll see what happens. I think there's uh, probably three things that uh, will make a huge difference in the markets as far as Trump's presidency goes. I think right now the, the three things that I'm looking at are uh, his stances on uh, three topics. One is protectionism. And he's made some, some bold statements about trade agreements and uh, how he's going to toughen up on those. You know, uh, we forget in all of that rhetoric that Buick, for example, sells more cars in China than they do in the United States. So that protectionism uh, rubs both ways. And as much as we want to protect and, and foster, uh, especially manufacturing jobs in the United States, there is a, a delicate global balance, and it's a it's a touchy situation. You know, we've created so many jobs in China and India that now these people have money for the first time. And because they have money for the first time, they want to buy goods and services uh, from all over the world. And I think that we have to have the confidence that we'll be able to deliver some of those goods and services to those people who are now uh, consumers for the first time ever. Remember, our economy here in the U.S. has driven 70% on consumption. So we push our GDP further if we're buying, if we're spending. And I know that's not necessarily a, a healthy argument, especially for people that are facing retirement and looking at savings and, and putting money away. But that's the reality. Uh, we are a consumption-driven economy. And if these other countries who are for the first time getting paychecks instead of uh, literally bags of rice for payment want to buy things, then we need to be in a place that we can deliver those goods and services, not 
uh, build walls and, and protect ourselves from that trade. That's my opinion. It's a it's a painful transition, but you know, remember a uh, hundred years ago in this country, ninety percent of the population was employed by agriculture. And as we built these tractors that would do the work of twenty men, nineteen of those men were out of jobs. And what did they do? They came into town, they went to work in the factory, and uh, that started the industrial revolution. It was a very painful, uh, very uh, dramatic adjustment to those people. Uh, who had to give up an entire culture of the way that they worked in order to transition into the Industrial Revolution. Now, uh, you know, 100 years later, uh, we act like we don't have any other choices, that there are no other options. And I think there are. I think that the United States will become the entrepreneurs to the world. So, you know, this is too short a time period to do a full lecture on on the economics of uh, global uh, trade and and I think that Trump can certainly do some things to make some of our trade agreements uh, more favorable to us, and I hope that he does that. Uh, but I'm not a fan of just out and out total protectionism, where uh, we don't uh, we cut off that trade with other countries and, and uh, limit our exports in that way. Uh, the other thing I think uh, will be uh, a very big telling point are taxes. Uh, he's vowed to lower the corporate tax rate. Uh, we have the highest. Uh, corporate tax rate of any industrialized country. So we're the we are the, what is the antithesis of a tax haven. And that's why you see so many of these companies figuring out ways to move as much to their sales overseas and keep those sales overseas so that they're taxed overseas legally uh, through tax treaties that we have with those other countries. Uh, they're not breaking the rules. They're just taking advantage of, of the rules so that they can stay competitive. Every dollar that they lose to taxes is a dollar less that they can reinvest in infrastructure and jobs and growth. So the more that we give these companies more of their own money uh, to build and grow or to pay out in dividends uh, to the shareholders, uh, it's a better filter than paying it to the government, letting the government run it through their system to reinvest it in infrastructure and so forth. It's just not nearly as efficient. It hasn't proved to be in, in almost every category. So if he would lower the corporate tax rate to 15%, it significantly eliminates uh, the reason for those companies to play games and to look for those loopholes and take advantage of different strategies. Um, and that should keep a lot more of those dollars here working in the United States. United States. Mm -hmm. The other thing that he's talked about doing is putting a 10% tax on these repatriated dollars. These corporations have a lot of money. They sell, you know, a lot of products. General Electric, Coca-Cola, for example, uh, now sell the majority of their products outside the United States than they do inside. So, you know, if they have the ability to tax those at a 12% rate in Ireland or 12.5% rate in Switzerland, then they certainly need to do that to reduce their overall tax liabilities. If we eliminate that penalty with our corporate tax rate, then I think a lot of those dollars will come back, especially if it's a 10% flat rate to get those dollars repatriated back in the United States. Uh, the estimates are that there are somewhere around $3 trillion. Other thoughts are that the number is significantly higher, uh, that that's just the amount that the government knows about. Uh, and my guess is that that's probably true, that the number is probably north of $3 trillion, maybe significantly north of $3 trillion. And if the majority or even part of that money comes back in the United States, I think that could be a huge windfall to our economic growth here. And the last thing I think that is a key factor, uh, and this is one that especially pertains to our industry, is the reduced regulation. Uh, you know, one of the first things that came out of his, uh, his presidential win was a uh, commentary about the DOL rule and that the DOL rule will probably be tabled postponed or uh, or changed. And I think that would certainly be uh, a positive for our industry, even though somewhat contradictory that uh, we would not be in favor of the fiduciary rule. Um, at, uh, at the surface, I'm totally for the fiduciary rule. We've always been, um, been governed by the fiduciary rule as a registered investment advisory firm. And we love the idea that everybody would be held to the same level playing field, especially the broker-dealer community. So, you know, the details were where the problems came up. And the details were in the implementation and the enforcement of that rule. And I think that uh, it, it proved us, itself to be a complete quagmire of regulation and issues and, and cost. 
uh, some of the cost estimates, some of the money that these companies have already spent anticipating compliance is a significant amount of money. And where does that money go? It really doesn't go into creating new jobs or creating, um, you know, uh, growth to the GDP. So uh, just an expense and uh, not necessary. So if he can continue to do that with our industry and the DOL rule, and he does that with other industries where we break down some of these uh, regulations, one of which is the, um, the health care system. If these employers are required to pay for these, to put in, uh, you know, uh, health care programs, there's a cost to that. That means there's less dollars to be spent on research and development, expansion, new jobs, and raises. So I think those are the three key factors. You know, let's look at protectionism. Let's look at what he does with taxes. And let's look at what he does with uh, hopefully reduced regulations. I think that will really pave the way for what could be uh, a pretty explosive possibility of growth in this country. And I think what we've seen from literally the middle of the night after the election, the dramatic turnaround in the stock market where the market was down, the Dow was down over 900 points at one point uh, and turned up to be significantly positive by the end of the very first trading day. Huge, huge turnaround. I think top to bottom it was uh, over 1,100 points on the Dow in that one day. And so the, the election rally uh, has held at least to this point. Uh, and I think that What's uh, what's driving that? Or people are looking at what this new world will look like, and do we have the ability for these companies to continue to grow earnings and and expand? And if uh, if we can do that with less regulation and lower corporate taxes, I think that would be uh, significantly positive for uh, the stock market. So a couple things. One, uh, uh, you know, we we got it right about the election, but we got it completely wrong on interest rates. Uh, this chart that I have up here is showing the 10-year Treasury. And in the last uh, couple months since this drop in June, this was during the British exit, where the yield on the 10-year Treasury dropped down. It closed at 1.4% yield on the 10-year Treasury. Since that time, it's come up dramatically, and you can see just from the 1st of November how these interest rates have just completely spiked. And now we're at a, about a 232 yield on the 10-year Treasury. That's a 65% increase in the interest rate in just this couple months. Now, to increase that interest rate, you have to drive the value of those bonds down. So as those interest rates have increased, the value of the underlying bonds have, have gone down. So you've seen, um, you know, pretty dramatic drop in value uh, in the bond prices. So that yield is now up there. I, I think this is just an unbelievable number. Uh, if you look at where we've been, this is a one-year chart. Uh, we're back up to where we were, you know, last December uh, when the Fed last made a move and raised interest rates. So at this point a year ago, we were roughly at about the same yield here where we are now, where the um, we were just over uh, uh, 225, I think, back in uh, December 12 months ago. So since that time, actual interest rates came down, even though the Fed raised interest rates. We had this you know short-term drop here during the British exit. Uh, cooler heads prevailed. Markets got back to normal, and they were fairly well behaved until we just had this spike since the election. And I think that, you know, what that does is it shows how much uh, people were were um, uh, concerned about the election, and, and maybe this is just a, a relief, you know, that the, that the election is over, uh, regardless of who won. Uh, hard to tell. Who knows? But, um, you know, it would be interesting to see now there's speculation that uh, the Fed may not raise interest rates um, in December this year, um, which I'm not sure that that's justified for the Fed to raise interest rates. We don't have uh, very high inflation. We don't have runaway growth that they should be slowing down. And those are usually the two rationales that the Fed has for raising interest rates. So, you know, I think this is an interesting chart. Um, another chart that I, I find fascinating is this one. Um, and this shows the, if we look at this top graph here, it shows the net uh, money flows into mutual funds. And the dark bar here is the U.S. stock market. And you can see back here in the late 90s, 
where we had five consecutive years where the S&P increased over 20% for those five years. Of course, everybody was chasing those investments. So when those markets were doing very well, when those markets were very high, you had a lot of people putting a lot of money into the stock market, which is really not the right time to do it. They should have been buying back here when it was lower and then gotten those appreciations. And then, of course, in 2000, the market dropped. Uh, in 2002, the market, or 2001, the market was down. And in 2002, the market was down as well. We had a rebound here in 2003, and you started to see people buying back in. But then after this uh, collapse in 2008, where we had a huge sell-off in uh, holdings in 2008 as the financial crisis credit default swap uh, meltdown started to happen. Since that point, in these last seven years, we have had one year out of seven that has had a positive inflow to equity mutual funds. That, that's just an incredible number. That, that tells me that the American people have just lost faith in the, in the American stock market. And I think that if you look at a seven-year time period like this where six out of seven of these years people were pulling money out of these uh, out of the equity markets instead of putting money in, that's just unbelievable. I mean, you can imagine how many 401k plans there are that people are driving money into those plans, you know, pay period by pay period by pay period, but they're not going into the stock market. And I think that is probably a reason why uh, the stock market has not performed as well as it could have, although our earnings, price to earnings ratios are still uh, pretty much in line with where they've been historically, maybe even a little bit on the high side. But we have ha had significantly higher P.E. ratios in the past, which we did back here in the late 90s. And that's not necessarily healthy. Uh, usually at that point, when you get up close to 20 on a P.E. ratio, then you've got a little bit of a sell-off, and we did. So historically, we've been at about 15 to 16 on the P.E. ratio of the S&P 500 companies. But in the last roughly uh, a little over a year, we've seen very, very little growth in the stock market at all. And in this time period, as this, as large stocks here uh, have not grown very much at all, the S&P 500 components, the, the 500 biggest companies in this country, uh, have continued to book higher and higher earnings. So that valuation is not reflected here in this, uh, in this jump in the, in the uh, stock market. So hard to say. You know, I, I think that what we need is we need companies to grow more. We need higher GDP growth. Uh, if we have that higher GDP growth, then we're going to get higher earnings out of the S&P 500. If we get that, then it's justified to have a higher valuation in the stock market. And I think all of that could be accomplished by lower regulations. And I think that's a significant factor that's been holding back American businesses. American businesses have been growing despite the help uh, that they've had from the government, uh, which is in more cases, building roadblocks rather than paving the road ahead of them. So hopefully, you know, it looks like the rhetoric out of this um, new administration is that they are going to be pro-business, and I think the market has certainly reflected that up to this point. So that's my um, my recap of what's happened and, and what I think is going to happen. Okay. you have any comments on that, Rick? Yeah, yeah. Hey, thoughts? Tony, can you... Yeah, can you go back to the interest rate chart real quick? We talked a while back in our analysis uh, when when rates were uh, right there in the consolidation period, August, September, following the Brexit, where they came back and stabilized a little bit. We were speculating that there was some real uh, worldwide forces that were going to tend to keep those down in that range and perhaps even lower over the course of time. Where do you see that from this standpoint, do you think maybe some well, of that's alleviated, or no? no I, I would think that that argument is even stronger at this point. You know, if, mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. where we were here when interest rates were at one point six, one point seven, you know, right in this mm -hmm. range, uh, we were making that argument that at one point six, one point seven, that out of the thirty largest industrialized countries, our ten-year Treasury yield was higher than everybody except Portugal. Everybody. Mm -hmm. We were 29th out of 30 countries, and the top three countries, Germany, Japan, and Switzerland, all have negative 10-year treasuries in their government-issued um, bonds. So in 
Japan and Switzerland, for example, there's $13 trillion in cash sitting there that is paying a fee to be there overnight. Mm -hmm. How much, how long do you pay that bill before you start looking at, you know, a two plus percent yield in our 10 year treasury before that looks pretty darn attractive to you? And mm -hmm. as we've seen, you know, the dollar has continued to get stronger, especially since the election. So it makes those a little bit more expensive to, uh, for the outside the U.S. to buy those treasuries because of the strength of the dollar. And I think that even though this rate uh, yield has gone up, the fact that the uh, dollar has gone has gotten stronger means that people are buying more dollars and mm -hmm. they're not yet buying treasuries. But I, I think that that will follow suit. Uh, I just mm -hmm. can't imagine that there are, you know, tens of trillions of dollars around the world that could easily invest in a 10-year treasury paying better than 2%, and they would rather keep it at home and pay a fee to, to park it in the bank overnight. You know, right. I, I can't recall off the top of my head, but I want to say that uh, outside of the top five yields, uh, the other 25 countries, the 10-year Treasury yield was all below 1%. That's below where this chart even starts. We're down at mm -hmm. 1.2 here. So everybody mm -hmm. else in the world, other than the, the five highest, us, Portugal, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, other than those countries, everybody's paying interest rates that are well below where this chart even shows. I, I just can't imagine that there's not at some point going to be more money flowing into uh, U.S. Treasuries right. to, to keep that yield down. But there's something going on there, apparently something that uh, that I don't understand, you know, in the balance of the of the economics worldwide. I don't understand why anybody would leave money in Japan and, and Germany and uh, Switzerland when they can get a pretty significant yield compared to paying a fee for parking those dollars overnight. They have other concerns. So, you know, and I think that the, the biggest concern that that we have and the world has about our economy is our debt. You know, we have $20 trillion worth of debt. We don't seem to be able to do anything about that legislatively. Uh, but there is a there is a fix. There is a way out of that mess. If we don't change our tax code and we don't reduce government spending, uh, we can grow our way out of that of that debt. Uh, if we increase our GDP, then that creates higher revenue mm -hmm. to the government. And during the presidential debates and a lot of the commentary where they talk about Trump's tax bill is going to cost us this much and so forth, uh, what they what they look at is if we lower taxes, then they just look at how much less revenue the government has because of those lower taxes. They don't factor in any growth. And right. this, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people refer to this as Reaganomics 2.0. The idea is if you lower tax rates, you give people more money, you give corporations more money, and those people will spend it, and 70% of our economy is driven on consumption. And what will they do? They'll buy TVs, they'll buy new cars, they'll buy new houses. That creates jobs, that creates reinvestment, that creates uh, significantly higher returns, creates bigger earnings for the S&P 500 companies. It all kind of goes hand in hand. So to say that, you know, Trump's tax uh, strategy would cost us in, GD in, in uh, higher levels of debt uh, ignores the possibility that we could have pretty significant growth in GDP. I've heard uh, estimates that say that if we could get our GDP growth rate to 4%, which is no small feat, uh, but if we could get our growth rate to 4% year over year with no changes in tax laws and no reduction in government spending, uh, we could pay our way, we could, we could then earn our way to pay off the government debt in a fairly short period of time. But that's a pretty big ask, you know, to get from where mm -hmm. we are now at 1.5% GDP growth to 4%, that would be, uh, pretty significant gains. But, but the fact is that uh, what we will likely have is some combination of that. We won't have 4% GDP growth, but if we get it to 25 maybe to 3 that's going to have a significant impact in the revenue that the government has uh, to, uh, to work with. If they don't increase spending, if they don't put in more expensive programs, and they use some of that money to pay the debt, then we could see a path to, uh, to reducing or significantly uh, cutting off that debt. If we did that, then I think that uh, the world would definitely be a buyer of our 10-year treasuries at 2% uh, plus yield. 
But, you know, I think that the world is concerned about that debt level. I think the world is concerned about that debt level as, as we are here domestically as well. Well, that will be something to watch moving forward. Uh, definitely, we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of things unfold very rapidly right now. So, well, thanks for that. Like you said, Tony, we uh, we're a little short on time to try to do a full analysis of this, but uh, that's great information on on where we're moving with the stocks, where we're moving with the uh, interest rates, and hopefully, we will start to see a little more clarity on where we're moving with some regulation here. So. Thank you so much for that, and I'm going to wrap it up here. And uh, we'll Thanks, be Rick. back with everybody here in a couple of weeks with uh, with some more insights and uh, maybe some more specifics on uh, some strategies we're working with uh, as things unfold. But until next time, this is Rick Geiler, presenter today, Tony Fiorillo from Asset Management Strategies. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks for being with us, everybody.